Morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. It is good to see you. I hope you're uh, awake this morning. I hope the music helped you to wake up. I liked it. It was good stuff this morning. Amen. Good words. Good, just, just good stuff. I'm, I'm excited about that. Past few weeks, we have really focused in on Easter. Uh, we have really focused in on Jesus uh, resurrecting out of the ground. And uh, this week, I want, to, I want us to go just one more step. I want to take one more step in what we're talking about and what we're thinking about. Thinking about Jesus uh, being resurrected, uh, coming out of the grave. And I want to ask a question of us this morning. I want to ask, what will we leave at the cross? When we think about Jesus and we think about the cross... We see the cross there. In your mind's eye, if you would, please go with me to a place called Golgotha. Would you look around and you would see no one is there but you. Everybody else is gone. No one is left. It has become very, very quiet on this hill. All of Jesus' family has left and gone. All of the religious leaders have now left, no longer mocking Jesus. Like Jesus, the two that were hung with him, they're dead now. The Roman soldiers have had another successful crucifixion, and they have gone away. Joseph of Arimathea has come and has taken Jesus' body down off of the cross and has taken him away and has hastily buried him in his own tomb. All's very quiet. It's very quiet. In the shadows, we see the three iron spikes that held Jesus to the cross. We see the rough prickly crown of thorns laying on the ground at the foot of the cross. We see the jar and the rag that held the the wine and the vinegar or the gall that was offered to Jesus there. And when we look at the foot of the cross, we see the blood of Jesus in the dirt surrounding the cross. If we look on top of the cross now, we can barely read the sign that says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. We look at these things, we see these things, and they are symbols, horrifying symbols, of a humiliating Roman crucifixion, and they have become signals to the infinite love of God for people like us. What kind of God is it that will go to such lengths to save us? What kind of God is it that would look down upon us, upon me, and think I was worth saving? Noticing all that brought Jesus to the cross, we sit in silence, and I'm asking you to ask this question of yourself. What will I leave at the cross? What do I bring to the cross? What am I going to bring and leave at this cross? Think about this with me for just a minute. What if what we've done is we brought all of our bad moments to the cross? What if what we've done bring all of our mad moments to the cross? Or maybe what we bring is our anxious moments to the cross. And for a good many of us, what about our final moments here in this world? Would we be willing to bring that to the cross? I want to suggest to us this morning and let us know and tell us that Jesus died for all of the bad moments in our life. In other words, Jesus died for the sin in our life. We think about what he done. He died for us. Our sins are forever gone as far as God is concerned. He remembers them no more. more. 
Remember, he says they are as far as from the east is to the west. They're buried at the bottom of the sea. He remembers them no more. He has forgiven them, and he remembers them no more. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25 says this to us. It says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. I don't remember your sins anymore. Amen. Amen that we have a God who is willing to look at us, willing to see us, and willing to forgive us, and willing to remember our sins no more. Jesus also transforms our mad moments. <laughs> How many of you got mad at each other this morning before you come into church this morning? Huh? Oh, come on. Come on now. How many of you got upset with each other before you come into church this morning? Did you have any discussions before you got here this morning? How about the mad moments? How about maybe the discussion we had this past week with our boss? Maybe one of our children made us mad or made us angry this week. Something may have happened and there's something inside of us. There's something that allowed anger to come and to be there. Listen, Jesus wants us to bring our mad moments to him also. Romans chapter 12, verse 17, Paul reminds us of this. He says, Repay no one evil for evil, but, gi but give thought to do what is honorable in, in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry... Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Anger. Anyone angry this morning? Anybody got some anger built up in them this morning? Why don't we go to the cross and leave it at the cross. Jesus also wants to take our anxious moments. Anybody anxious this morning? Any anxiety going on this morning? Is there something going on in our life that we're anxious about? Jesus wants us to bring our anxious moments to him also. Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 6, Paul again writes to us and he says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, if we really and truly bring it to him, it will guard. He will guard us. We can take those to him and we can leave them there with him. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7 says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. God cares for you. Jesus died and hung on a cross that we can take our anxiety to him. And he wants us to take it and bring it and lay it at the cross. How about final moments? I don't know about you, but I've given thought to what maybe my final moments in this world might would be. I'm hoping that God would see fit to just let me go. I'm hoping I don't have to lay or don't hoping I don't have to linger. I hope I don't have to be a burden to my family in any way whatsoever. I, I would just rather the Lord just say, it's time and I go. That would be my druthers if I could have my druthers. But I, I don't know if that's the way it's going to be. But what about our final moments? And what would our final moments be and what would our fi final moments look like? I can tell you that uh, my great-grandmother and my great-grandfather, old Church of God folks from a long time ago, my grandmother died unexpectedly. My great-grandmother died unexpectedly. She went first before my great-grandfather did. We fully expected my great-grandfather would go before she did. didn't work out that way. My great-grandfather lingered for, for a while, and 
he did have to kind of have some help. He had to have uh, his children came in. They all sat with him. My dad, grandchildren, some came, sat with him, and was with him uh, bef before he before he passed. And as they were with him in the hospital room, they were witnessing and listening to him. He was kind of speaking out of his head, talking out of his head. He he was remembering things from the past, and he was talking to the kids, and he would call out people that weren't there, and he would talk to people who weren't there. But just before he passed, he was laying in the hospital bed, and my grandpa and I think several of his brothers, my uncles, were standing around beside him. And just before he passed... They said he looked up and he, he was able to take his head and to tilt his head up and he was staring. And he looked at them and he said, do you see it? Do you see it? He got this bright look on his face which he had not had. He took his last breath. I fully believe he saw Jesus coming for him. I fully believe that he had, was able to look and he was able to see that, that Jesus and his angels were there and he was able to step from that body across the threshold of heaven's gate into Jesus' arms. I believe that. Have you ever thought about your final moments? Are you anxious about your final moments? I would hope. Boy, I would hope. You know what I would hope? I would hope that I would be able to, y'all are going to expect me to say I'd be out on a horse riding around behind a cow and drop off my horse, right? Now, uh, that wouldn't be bad. I mean, that wouldn't be bad either, but you know what would be good? Having made sure that I had done everything that I possibly could to try to ensure that my family knows Jesus Christ. That my friends would know Jesus Christ. And that one of the very last acts that I ever had the opportunity to do in this world was to tell somebody about Jesus Christ and maybe lead them to Jesus so that I would know that I would know that I would know I'll see them again one day. Brothers and sisters, that's final moments and sometimes what happens when we get to thinking about those things, we don't like to think about those things. Those are things that, that, we, that are not, not necessarily our most favorite topics. But guess what? What did Jesus die for? Jesus didn't die that when we died here, it would be that's all there is. The whole reason why we are here right now is because we know there's more. We know that Jesus has came and he has, through him and what he has done, his sacrifice for us for the forgiveness of our sins and allowing him to be Lord and, and Savior of our life. We know that there's more and we know that we get to go be in heaven with him forever. I didn't say that it's not scary. If every single one of us are honest, we'd say it's kind of scary. We don't know what's there. We don't, we've never done it before, right? But what Jesus says and what he guarantees to us, he's standing there waiting on us, ready to welcome us in, ready to say, well done, and good and faithful servant. Amen? So what we, when we think about those things, what, what, we, what we leave at the cross, why don't we leave our bad moments, our sin at the cross? Why don't we leave our mad moments, those moments when we're angry with people and when people are angry with us, why can't we take those and go to the cross with them? Why can't we take our anxious moments where we're anxious about different things, the anxiety that fills our life, why can't we go there and exchange it for the peace that Jesus brings to our life. Why can't we take our final moments, our final moment to Him, and allow Him to walk us through and to be there with us? Amen? He promises He will be. He says He'll do that for us. Well, what else can we leave at the cross? Maybe there's some other things, maybe some other things we might be able to look at that we could leave at the cross. What if we left the wrong way that we see God? A lot of people have different views of God. Not everybody sees God the same way. So what if we left the wrong way that we see God? 
What if what we do is the way that we see ourselves? Because too many people have a pretty bad opinion about themselves. There's way too many people in this world walking around who simply will not give their life to Jesus because they don't think they're worth it. And Jesus died for them. So what about the way that we see ourselves? What about the way we see others? What about the way that we look at others? Or talk to others? Or treat others? What about life itself? What about the way that we look at the life that we're living itself? When we look at God, we see a loving An inviting God. He is not a distant, accusing God. Too many people have this opinion of God that he's just, he's just, I think they think he's a grumpy old man. They think he's just this guy that's sitting on the throne waiting for you to mess up so that he can punish you. I think that's a view that people have. I think a lot of people have a view of God that says he's there, we're here. He does his thing, we do our thing. He's not really concerned about me or my life or anything like that. Brothers and sisters, that is not the God of the Bible. That is not what the Bible tells us about who he is. He is a loving and he is an inviting God. Listen again to a familiar verse that helps us to know and understand God. For God so loved the world He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Brothers and sisters, that is a loving God. That is a God who has saw us and saw where we are in life, saw how we lived our life and knew that it could not measure up. He has provided a way for us. He's done that because he loves us so very much. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the writer of Hebrews says this to us. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in the time of need. Brothers and sisters, that's the God we serve. That's the picture of God and who God really and truly is. He is a God who loves us and saw where there was no way, He made a way. And not only did He make a way, He made Himself approachable and wants us to approach him with everything in our life and everything in our heart. So many times people will come to me and they will talk about and they'll say, Pastor, I can't get saved or you don't want me to come to church down there because I, I'm, you know, I've lived my life this way, I've done this, I've been a part of that. Uh, in other words, what they're trying to tell me is I'm a sinner, been a pretty good sinner, done an awful lot of things. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that Jesus Christ died for your sin. There isn't a sin that you've committed that he cannot or will not forgive. Because he loves you. I want us to know that and I want us to receive that. I want us to have it in our heart. heart. I want us to know it beyond the shadow of a doubt. That he, he really and truly did die for us to cover our sins. That we might could be brought back and be... That, that we could be seen through the eyes of Jesus as a righteous and holy people. That's what Christ done for us. That's what Jesus has done for us. Luke ver, uh, chapter 19 verse 10 says, For the Son of Man, listen, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came to seek out and to save the the sinner. He came, to, he came to seek out and to save the one who needs him. The one who will cry out to him. The one who will say, I need you in my life. The old familiar story. There were a hundred sheep. One of them left. What happened? What did Jesus do? What did he say the shepherd done? He went after the one, didn't he? What about the lady who who had ten coins, and she lost a coin. What did she do? 
She lit a lamp, lamp and she went to every dark corner of her house trying to find that coin, right? What about the prodigal son? What about the one who had it all? Who knew it all? Took his share, left, went away, lost it all. Comes back home. And what does he find? And what does he come to? He comes to a father running to him with outstretched arms, saying, Welcome home. Welcome home. Brothers and sisters, that's God. And we need to be able to see ourselves as God sees us. We need to be able to see ourselves as people who are forgiven. We, are, we need to be able to see ourselves as a holy people. And yes, I said that. I mean that. We need to see ourselves as a holy people because that's how God sees us. Listen to me. Who you were is not who you are now. You are a new creation. What has happened to you, there's just been... You, listen, you've got to... You, you, uh, I'm... I'm thinking so fast, I can't keep up. That's, see, that's my Arkansas going. That's, that's, I'm from Arkansas. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk faster than I can think. What a tr blood transfusion. You got a blood transfusion. You got royal blood flowing through your veins now. Because what happened is, you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. You are a brand new person. You are not who you used to be. You no longer have to go back to that life. You no longer have to live in that life anymore. You don't return back to your sinful nature. You are in Christ now. You do have a holy being living inside of you now. And what he wants us to do is to know and to understand through him being inside of us, what we can do is we can take that and we can draw off of that power to be able to be who we're supposed to be for him. That's God. That's Jesus. And we no longer have to look at ourselves with shame. Might have been, not, listen to me. Yeah, I know you guys probably get so tired of him talking about it. There he goes, he wants to say this again. I've done some pretty shameful things when I was living according to my sinful nature. Some, I mean some shameful things. But you know what? I realized they were shameful. Guess what? I don't want to go back and do them anymore. I don't want to go back there anymore. I don't have to go back there anymore. Because now I have Jesus Christ living inside of me. Now I've got, I've got the Holy Spirit inside of me. Try, I may be kind of like one of them horses that fights the bit a little bit, you know. You kind of have to. I'm probably, Tom, I'm probably a, a, a plow reiner is probably the best way to describe me, yeah. I gotta, I'm one of them old plow rein horses where you got to reach down and grab him and do like this to get him to go. You know, a good, well-trained horse, Tom and, and, and these guys can tell you, they can just put a knee in a horse and he'll turn, he'll do this, he'll do that. He works off signals and things that are just so well-connected. I think I'm a plow reiner. I'm, I'm one of those plow reiners that, you know, got to kind of jerk me around sometimes. But listen, nothing you've done can cause God to not love you. He doesn't like what, what happens and what we do. Sin, the sinful nature, he doesn't like that. But he doesn't stop loving you. And he wants you to get right with him. Brothers and sisters, that's, I mean, the best way to put that is with your children. Your, has your kids ever let you down? They ever disappointed you? Ever kind of done something other after you tell them, don't you do that, right? I've done my mom and dad that way. Our kids have done us that way. I don't love them any less. I might fuss at them a little bit. I might give them, <laughs> read them the right act. I scared poor Dylan to death yesterday. Dylan, I t Dylan and, and Harley and, and, and Anadine came over yesterday, and I, got, I jumped in the truck with, uh, with Dylan. I went to go show him something down the road and was just kind of talking to him about some things. And when he got in the truck, he's kind of looking over at me, and he was like, because I didn't tell him why we needed to get in the truck. I said, let's just get in the truck. Let's go down the road. And he, <laughs> he was sweating. <laughs> he, was, he said, when I, after I started talking to him, what I was going to talk to him about, he, he, said, he said, 
Man, he kind of blew. He said, I thought I was in trouble. He said, I was trying to figure out what I'd done. He said, I, I was sitting here trying to go through everything, trying to figure out what I'd done. It wasn't anything like that. <laughs> he loves us. He cares for us. And even though, even though we have sinned, he wants to forgive our sin. And he wants us to know how much he loves us. How about the way we see others? How about if what we try to do is try to see others as God sees them? Because remember, he's seen me. He's seen me at my worst. He's seen me doing things that I wasn't supposed to be doing. How about if what we've done is we see others as God sees them? Every, listen to me. I cannot stress this enough. Every single person in this world, without exception, is valuable to God. Now, we can look and we can, we can say, well, I don't agree with this. I don't like that. I don't like what those people do. I don't like their religion. I don't like this. God sees people and he loves people and he sees value in people. He saw value in us. He saw what we could do. He saw what we could be capable of. And he, wanted, he wants to bring that to fulfillment in our lives. He wants to bring it to fulfillment in other people's lives. He wants us to be able to see other people as he sees them. How about... Uh, How about the tragedies of our life? How about the hard things? Every time I start to talk about that, I can try to think about some of the hard things that I've been through in my life, but every single one of us could know and probably list or look at someone and say, but they've, they've been through more than I have. They've seen more of a tragedy than I have. They have experienced more of a tragedy than I have. But God wants to work through those. God wants to be able to use every single part of our life in order to be able to help us to see him and to be able to help us to help others. I believe that every experience that we have in our life is something that we can learn from and something that we can take uh, and, and be able to help someone else with. Brothers and sisters, I, I hope we know this by now. There is a reason why we use the word family here. It's because we're family. If we come here and we take a lone wolf mentality, if we come here and just kind of say, well, I'm kind of a lobo, I kind of do my own thing, I'm going to tell you, that's not Christianity. That's not what Christ set up. That's not what he wants from his church. From his church, what he wants is family. He wants us to be Connected. He wants us to love each other. He wants us to be able to talk with each other. That's why we are a family. That's why we say things like brothers and sisters. Because now you are a brother or sister through Christ to me and I to you. So it's important that we see that. It's important that we understand that. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Let me read it again. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Brothers and sisters, there is a qualifier there as much as we would like to that's meant for the Christian. That's meant for the believer. That's meant for the one who has given their life to Jesus Christ. And what he's doing is he's working in that person's life. 
And he's, he's calling them, he's guiding them, and he's allowing them to see and to, to, to live their purpose out, to find their purpose and to fulfill their purpose. For those of us who have been called, for those of us who have answered that calling, for those of us who are living for Jesus, that is not for every single person in the world. It doesn't work that way for every single person in the world. It only works for those whom he knows. So how's life been going lately? What's been going on? Have you had the peace and have you had the assurance in your life and in your heart that you know God knows? Do you have the assurance and do you have the peace that you know Jesus knows and he's going through it with you? My yoke is easy, my burden is light. He's yoked up with you. Or am I struggling? Am I wondering? Brothers and sisters, if we don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life, that promise is not for us. It is only for the one who does know and knows it for sure. Please, please make the decision to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. Because He does work things out. Even the tragedies... Even the, th even the hard things that happen to us in our life, he works them out. It doesn't wipe away the tragedy. It doesn't take away the hurt or anything from the tragedy, but it does allow us to go through the experience and to recognize and to understand him and who he is, and he can allow us to be able to use that experience not only to help ourselves, but to help a fellow brother and sister who might need that one day. All of our experiences can be helpful to someone. How many times have you listened to somebody who stood up and said, I will, I, this is what I've done, this is who I was, and everybody could go, amen, I know that. I remember when, you know, when they used, and they can look and they can say, I'm different now. All of our experiences help us to be able to come to a place just like that. Genesis 5, 20, verse, chapter 5, verse 20 says this also. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. That's Joseph when he confronted his brothers. Remember, they threw him in a pit and sold him to the slaves. And he went through all that he went through. And Joseph comes back and says, you meant it for evil, but God took it and made good out of it. Brothers and sisters, this morning I want us to know and I want us to see that God wants to take all of these experiences, He wants to take all of these things, and He wants us to know that we can live in Him. We can have peace in Him. We can have joy in Him. A real peace, a real joy. Not, not something that lasts just for a few minutes. But something that is there through everything, no matter what it may be. We can have a true joy. We can have a true peace. Listen to this statement. What kind of a difference did Jesus make? What kind of a difference did the disciples realize that Jesus made for them? And what so impressed them to take this story, this gospel message, to the world around them? It's when they were able to come to a place and they were able to know and to understand that when Jesus died, so did their sin. When Jesus rose, so did their hope. Brothers and sisters, Jesus has died for us. We put our trust and we put our, our, our hope in him. Guess what happens? He takes away our sin. What does he do? He gives us a hope. He gives us something that we can know, something that we can trust, something that we know is real, something that we believe in, and on our dying breath, may we be able to go out saying hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God.
Take one more with you. Tell one more somebody about who Jesus is. And allow them to realize Jesus died for their sin and he rose to give them hope. Amen? So who in the world needs to meet Jesus today and be saved? Who needs to meet Jesus today and be saved? Who's going to tell them? Who's going to be the one that's going to be willing to go out and to go, be able to say, I'll share the gospel message. I'll take it. I'll tell someone today. You see, this great story of Easter and all of its gifts is a story for sharing with the world. And it needs to be shared with the world. And here's what I'm asking to this morning. I'm asking this. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, you don't know that you know. And I know many times come to a place like this in time of the service, we'll say certain things, we'll do certain things. Brothers and sisters, from the bottom of my heart, what I want for every single person is to know. I don't want you to be a person who's, who sit in a pew and heard about God and knew about God and what Jesus did. I want you to be the person who can say, I know Him. Not just about Him. So what I'm going to ask is this morning, and please, everybody do this. Bow your heads, would you please? Close your eyes. If someone this morning is not sure that they know Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life, would you please just simply raise your hand? Yes, I see those hands. I see them. Anyone else? Thank you. Maybe this morning someone is saying, you know what, I, Pastor, I, I've heard these things, I know these things, but well, I've gotten off the path. I'm not living for Jesus like I'm supposed to. I'm not, I'm not following Him like I'm supposed to. I, I know where I'm supposed to be, but, but I'm not there anymore. If you find yourself in that place this morning, let me tell you, it's, it's just like the prodigal son. He's running ready to meet you. If you find yourself in that place this morning, would you raise a hand and say, that's me, that's me this morning? I see those hands. I see those hands. Yes. I see them. Thank you. So while your eyes are still closed and your, your heads are still bowed, would you pray this prayer with me? Lord, this morning... I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. This morning, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And I repent of my sin. And I ask you to come and live inside of me. To guide me and direct me all the rest of the days of my life. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this morning, what greater joy is there than to know that we're all going to get to be together again one day? What greater joy is there than to be able to know that, that not only am I going to get to be able to do that now, but I, I've got something now to be able to, to live in. I'm living in Christ now. Amen? And that I have, I have Christ inside of me helping me to guide, my, to guide me in my life, to direct me in my life. And I can bring all of these things that we talked about this morning, I can bring them to the cross. And I can leave them there with the nails, with the crown of thorns, with the wine and the vinegar. 
I can leave them there. I can leave them there on the blood-soaked ground at the foot of the cross. And I don't have to pick them up and carry them anymore. Because guess what? He didn't die on the cross for you to bring them, lay them down, and then pick them up and carry them home again. He died on the cross so that you could bring them and leave them there. Amen? Amen. If you've prayed those prayers this morning, if something inside of you and you've prayed those prayers this morning, what I'm going to ask of you to do is simply let me know. It doesn't have to be anything spectacular. You don't have to run up and say, I prayed that prayer. All you've got to do is look at me. You can whisper it to me, whatever it is. Talk to me later after service. I prayed that prayer. I want to know that so that I know how to pray for you. Amen. If you would, please stand with me. Once again, so thankful for all of you and so thankful for you being here this morning. And I appreciate it so very, very much. And again, one more time. Right, here we go. The preacher's just like a broken record. He says things so many times, right? I love you. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Pray with me if you would, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for this time. Lord, we thank you that we have been able to be together here, thankful that we have been able to come together as family. For those who prayed the prayer this morning, maybe even for the very first time, I pray that you be with them. I pray that you bless them, and I pray that you guide them. Maybe for those who prayed, I've gone away, I've been, been led astray, I, I, I'm coming back. I pray that you would be with them also, Lord. And Lord, I pray and ask that as we go away from here that you'd guide us and direct us Help us to have a good afternoon. Bring us back together again this evening that we can once again worship together as a church family. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.